This is Wraith from Wraith Rain. I'm an author of serialized gay romance fiction. Every week on this podcast, I'll be reading a chapter from one of my gay fantasy shifter serials called Dragon's Rain. I'll explain at the break how you can find out more about the story and others I write. So let's get to it. Chapter 104 Relative Valerius and Caden flew wingtip to wingtip from the Grey Mountains back to High Reach. Their minds were even closer together, thoughts and emotions flitting back and forth between one another. It felt so natural, so right, and yet it had not been something he would have even considered a month ago. Caden had changed everything. Valerius thought of that moment when all of the dragons had been flying in formation around the earth. That sense that they could have a connection, if only he had reached out. But back then, he and Raziel had resented every interaction with the shifters, as he had with the humans. Now, he wondered, would the world have been safer? Would Caden have been happier if the dragons were connected? Caden wasn't exactly happy now. He was still sorting out his feelings from Landry's loss not able to fully believe she was gone forever. For his part, Valerius did not want to squash Caden's hope, but he was always of the mind that keeping expectations low meant rarely being disappointed. How are you doing? Caden asked suddenly. I've been so wrapped up in how I feel that I didn't ask you. I am fine, Caden, Valerius said automatically. Caden's silence had him grimacing. He could well imagine the young man lifting a disbelieving eyebrow at him, so he quickly amended his answer. I am worried. I do not know how to protect us from this enemy. My strength may be our biggest weakness. We'll figure something out, Caden said, but it was evident he didn't quite believe it. Perhaps Alarian will think of something, Valerius said as they swooped low over some golden fields and then flapped their powerful wings to head up into the clouds again. Do you think I was wrong getting between Alarian and Tez? Caden asked. No, I wasn't completely kidding about Alarian being helpful, Valerius answered. Mephis is powerful. Perhaps poisonous gas can put the behemoth to sleep. Alarian is a terrible bully, and what he's doing to his people is horrible. But sometimes I feel bad for him, Caden admitted. Do you? That sounds stupid now that I've said it out loud, Caden laughed. No, not stupid, but interesting. Why do you feel this way? Because it feels like he can be redeemed? Caden made that sound more like a question than a statement. He comes from a different time, Caden, when life was a lot cheaper and rulers truly had full control of their people and could do whatever they wanted with them, no matter how cruel, Valerius explained. But you came from times like that, too. Esme did as well. So did plenty of the others, actually, Caden argued. And you all managed to change? Why not Alarian? Because he remains in places that reflect his upbringing for a lot longer, Valerius told him. In a way, he isolated himself to people that reminded him of his youth when he was human. He will tell you that it is in every Russian's blood to suffer that they are brooding, brilliant, but also brutal people. Whether that is true or not, it is how he defines himself. There are just these moments when someone else flashes through him, Caden persisted. Valerius glanced over at the white dragon. Iolera's sleek form glittered under the rising moon. The dragon's blue eyes turned towards him, noticing his admiration. They closed slowly at him. It was the classic cat slow blink. Valerius grinned. Raziel let out an appreciative fireball, which Iolaire met with a smoke ring of ice. Caden and Iolaire were as beautiful inside as out. Iolaire is checking out Raziel too, Caden told him with a hum of happiness. This was good. Caden hadn't been happy since Celestine had returned. And what does Iolaire think? Valerius asked, even as Raziel did a barrel roll. Another laugh from Caden. It's quite impressed. It thinks that Raziel is darkness personified. It is the power of the earth and the devastation of flames. So Raziel is not the only poet between the two of them. 
Valerius laughed this time. He felt quite chuffed on Raziel's behalf, and it was rather amusing, yet heartwarming too, to see Raziel being loved by more than just him. How can everyone not love Raziel? The Black Dragon is awesome, Caden stated loyally, which had Raziel preening and doing loops one after another. Iolaire did larger loops around the black body, barely brushing by, which was a feat of aerobatics by both of them. We did not seek to be loved, Raziel spoke. We sought to be feared. To keep order, Caden asked, love is hard when one rules, and sometimes it is not always possible, Raziel answered. Do you think that's true of Mephis and Alarian, Raziel? Caden asked. They have little dragon syndrome, Raziel answered. This had Caden choking on laughter. Is that like Napoleon or Shortman syndrome? Yes, they do not feel that they are big enough, and therefore they end up looking small as they try to act bigger than they are, Raziel responded. Caden was thoughtful at this. They are always comparing themselves to you and Valerius then. Yes, and it is a vain thing to do, Raziel remarked with a spout of fire. They should be content with what they have, but instead they make themselves sick with envy by what they do not. Valerius was impressed by the fact that Raziel wasn't doing its normal growl about Mephis and pulling off its wings. It seemed to be meeting Caden at a more conciliatory level, though that wouldn't last if the green dragon tried anything. Yeah, like I said, there are flashes there of someone likable in Alarian and Mephis, Caden murmured. It would be easier if people were just evil, though, through and through, wouldn't it? Valerius finally said, Yeah, I guess it would be. But don't worry, I'm not looking for any good in the behemoth, Caden assured him. I know that it's too dangerous not to fight. We may need your way of thinking outside the box, Caden. I am not certain how we defeat this thing without losing too many people, Valerius reminded him. At that moment, they could see the lights of Reach. Both dragons put their heads down and their wings pumped powerfully as they sighted home. They circled the city once both scanning the ground below them to see that everything was all right. Reach appeared peaceful, and that was something. They went towards their tower chambers. Valerius let Caden go in first. With no trouble, Caden shifted and dropped in the classic superhero pose, before clearing out of the way for Valerius to do the same. The fires were already lit in their rooms. Valerius smelled meat and vegetables cooking over the fire. He frowned. Was Shioni still back in the Grey Mountains, who would be in their rooms cooking? Who's inside? Caden asked, eyebrows lifting. I do not know. Let us see. Valerius growled. Who would dare invade our lair? Raziel snarled, even as Iolair blinked steadily and stood next to the much bigger black dragon. Valerius stood ahead of Caden. Not that he didn't think Caden could hold his own against any adversary, but the young man was still shy about his nakedness. Valerius, of course, had no such compunctions. His hands curled into fists and he prepared to breathe fire at whoever had dared come into their rooms. It took him two seconds to come into view of the fire pit, only to see Marban using tongs to turn onions and peppers on the grill. There was a sizzling sound as more meat was added to the fire and hot fat crisped. The smell was maddeningly good as it always was. Marban? Valeria sounded rather strangled. Ah, my dear King Valerius and King Caden, how good to have you back. I thought to have a little snack prepared for you as flying is quite the calorie-burning activity, Marban said. Raziel and Iolair's attention was fully on the meat. They suddenly had no problem with this lair invader so long as it made them snacks. This looks great, Marban, Caden said as he scooched behind a chair and grabbed the blanket off the back of it before pulling it around his waist and tucking in the tail end of it. You came here to cook for us, Valerius asked. I came because I sensed you might need me, Marban stated. Cooking is simply my passion. Hidden depths, Marban, you have hidden depths, Caden said, as he snatched a piece of steak that was still smoking hot. He dipped it into a little pile of mineral salt and popped it into his mouth. Oh God, I want more, but I should go talk to Rose and Wally. I have to tell them. Caden's expression went bleak for a moment. I have to tell them about Landry. Valerius could almost see Marban's ears perking up, but the swarm shifter continued to cook. 
He clearly wanted to know about Landry, too, but he was keenly observing them both and learning just as much. I will make sure that King Valerius does not eat everything before you get back, Marban said. You will try, Valerius said. Valerius filched something off the grill directly. He, of course, was fireproof. He dipped the beef in some soy wasabi sauce. There was a burn from the wasabi paired beautifully with the umami of the soy. It's okay. I should see my parents too and maybe have a meal with them, Caden said with a nod. There's always a refrigerator full of meat for you and Iolaire. Valerius kissed his forehead. Do you want me with you when you go to speak to Wally and Rose? No, it's okay. You should stay here with Marban. Fill him in. Maybe his people will have seen some of these walls, Caden suggested. Again, Marban's ears perked up, but he turned peppers and onions so they did not burn. Did you know that you can get some of my gay romance books for free? Every month, I have at least one book free to download right from Amazon, so you can easily read it on any device. But these books can only be free for five days at a time. If you don't want to miss out, just sign up for my mailing list, and I'll send you an email whenever there's a free book available. The link to the sign-up form is in the description down below. Valerius nodded. Caden needed to do this on his own. He leaned down and kissed the young man's forehead. I'll bring you down a robe. Don't want any of the sensitive bits getting burned in the fire, Caden told him. Fireproof, remember? Valerius chuckled, but I appreciate the thought. Another kiss, and Caden was bounding up the stairs two at a time. Valerius snagged himself a jalapeno pepper that was stuffed with cream cheese and cheddar. Though the seeds had been scraped out, where most of the heat resided, it still had a hot bite to it. Marban offered him a piece of sweet Italian sausage that was wrapped in crispy bacon with the tongs. Bacon. Caden will be bereft if I eat all of these. Valerius murmured as he popped the fatty, juicy, crispy bit into his mouth in one piece and chewed. But it is so hard not to. Raziel's eyes were closed almost to slits as it enjoyed the sausage, too. Iolaire was flickering its ears at Raziel, wanting to know what it tasted like. What did you discover in the mountains? Marban asked after handing him a mushroom cap stuffed with crab and cream cheese. Valerius strove not to moan in pleasure. Marban was an incredible cook. Now, he wouldn't mind seeing the swarm shifter by his grill, though truly they had come a long way from loathing seeing the old man to potentially tolerating him. This. Valerius logged into his tablet and went to the secure server where all information was being kept. He cast it to the large screen on the wall. It showed a walkthrough of the cave to the wall where humans and shifters were caught in the potentially eternal embrace of stone. Marban watched it silently as Valerius explained what was being shown. The swarm shifter's black eyes flickered all over the screen, and Valerius knew that he was missing nothing. It was comforting to know that Marban was his counselor now, rather than on the opposite side of him. And when he heard Caden coming downstairs, he turned off the cast. Caden did not need to see that again. Caden bust his cheek as he handed Valerius a red silk robe that he pulled on. Caden was dressed in some ripped jeans that cupped his ass perfectly. Valerius had quite the view of that ass as Caden leaned over the grill to snatch several of the bacon-wrapped sausage pieces and a stuffed pepper. He then turned and looked at the two of them. I'll catch you guys a bit later. Valerius nodded, but found his heart twisting a little as Caden disappeared out of the doors. Rosio looked equally breft as it laid its chin on top of its front legs and let out a puff of smoke. May I see the video again? Marban asked. Valerius played it once more as he devoured steak, sausage, and peppers. He also slid some of the caramelized onions into his mouth as a chaser. After wiping his fingers clean, he went over and took out some of his rich, berry-forward Zinfandels. He poured a large glass for himself in Marban. Marban took a large swallow of the wine. I don't know whether I'm relieved or worried that you need a drink after seeing that, Valerius replied dryly. Marban took a more moderate sip of wine before setting down the glass firmly and going back to cooking. How many of these walls do you suppose there are? At least two, one in Anwar's territory and one here, Valerius explained. 
but I am certain there are more. Cain was right, that we need your people's eyes and ears to find others. Of course, I will be sending out the claw, but the more the better, Marban finished for him. He took off another steak. Valerius licked his lips, but Marban said, let it sit. Valerius grunted and went back to sausage and bacon, along with several stuffed peppers and mushrooms. Do you think the behemoth comes through these walls? Marban asked. I do. I think they are doorways, Valerius said. These people that were captured in the wall, they appeared to have been sucked inside. I wonder why, Marban murmured and stroked his chin. Were their souls separated from their bodies and bound to the behemoth? Valerius had not considered that, and he was glad that Caden was not here to hear that suggestion. Marban continued, I wonder if the behemoth needs a human form or if it simply uses energy from people to sustain itself. It could not have fit through the wall into the cavern, Valerius said, not unless it destroyed the mountain. So maybe that does indicate a human form. What sort of human would be able to bond with such a spirit, one wonders? Another chin stroke. I will immediately have my people on the lookout for these walls. We must find and monitor every one of them. I agree. There was a knock on the door and Valerius called, Come. He expected Shioni or one of the other dragon shifters, but it was Tilly who burst inside. He quickly shut off the casting again. Her cheeks were flushed. Her eyes were filled with tears. When she saw just him reaching for a bottle of wine, she skidded to a halt and her mouth opened in an O oh of surprise and a little fear. For his part, he was also frozen and also felt a little frightened. This was Caden's beloved little sister. She was also a 13-year-old girl. A modern tween or teen, he wasn't sure. He knew also absolutely nothing about such creatures, and she looked upset. Not at him, but in general. Marban lifted an eyebrow at him. King Valerius, Mr. Marban, she got out. I, I was looking for Caden. He is meeting with Wally and Rose right now, Valerius explained, just as haltingly to her. He didn't mention why. It was about Landry, of course. Maybe Tilly had heard about her. He wouldn't put it past Alarian to blast it far and wide and was upset. But he couldn't risk saying anything in case she didn't know, and then he would be the guilty one of blurting it out. Oh, she said softly. Well, I can see you're busy. I'll come back later. It would have been easy to let her go. Maybe it would have been wise, but she was Caden's sister. She was family to him and Marban wasn't making a face at him that indicated he should talk to the girl. Ironically, Marban probably had more experience dealing with tweens or teens. You don't have to leave. Stay. Eat something. Maybe I can help you? Valerius made that into a question. Tilly blinked large, cheery eyes and gave a jerky nod. She sat down on the couch, and Marban prepared a plate for her. Thank you, she said softly, and picked at the food. What's wrong, Tilly? Marben asked in that grandfatherly way of his. She sat there, stiff and formal, but her lower lip began to tremble, and Valerius had the sense that something was about to explode. Rosiel even cracked an eyelid in slight alarm, even though this little human couldn't harm them. Alice is being mean to me, and so are Rachel and Sam, she erupted. Ah, Marben said knowingly, as if he had any idea what she was talking about. Who are... Marban held up a hand to silence Valerius. These are good friends that you expect to be able to trust. Tilly nodded vigorously. So I saw that they were all chatting online and making plans. We have a private group thing. And when I asked if we could do it here, they were like, you're trying to show off, Tilly. I wasn't. I mean, mom and dad won't let me leave high reach right now. And then like Alice said that her mom didn't agree with King Valerius's politics. I do not have any politics. Valerius growled softly. I stay out of that. I know, right? It's such garbage. But Alice said to come to High Reach was to support things that weren't cool. And then Sam was like, we think it's best if we're not friends anymore. And I'm like, why? I haven't changed. And then I find out that he thinks humans first is right. Tilly drew breath finally. Have you been contacted by higher social status members of your school? Marban asked with as much seriousness as he would have given to politics among territories. Tilly nodded. Totally. I could see and hear their parents urging them on. She rolled her eyes. But at least they want to be near me. 
These other guys were my friends, but not anymore. You now represent something to them more than just yourself, Marban advised her as he cut out the steak, which had Valerius's stomach rumbling, and gave her the first serving. Steak, Raziel murmured. She is a guest. She gets first serving, Valerius said to his spirit, as much as he was telling himself. Marban put some steak aside for him. Valerius popped a few of the pieces into his mouth. You are going to find, Tilly, that from now on, most of your experiences with people will be tinged in small or large part by your brother's position, Marban explained. Tilly nodded again. So what do you suggest? There will always be some people you can trust. Identify them early. Hold them close. Watch them carefully, Marban said with, again, all due seriousness, being given to a teenager to politics. That makes sense. But what about everyone else? Tilly's forehead scrunched up. Your inclination is to reward only those who care for you because of you, Marban stated as he gave Valerius another pepper. Yeah, that's what mom and dad would tell me, she said. But that's not really what you should do, because you wish to be of use to your brother, Marban said as he waved tongs in the air. You need to use them for what they are worth. Pretend there is bulletproof glass between you and them. They cannot touch you. The glass is clear, so they don't know it is there. But you do. Valerius must have made a sound as both Marban and Tilly turned to him. Tilly had been nodding along with Marban's rather Machiavellian view of friendship. Part of Valerius wanted to say that she should listen to her parents and not the criminal swarm shifter. But, but Marban was giving her a realistic view of how things would be as a ninth dragon shifter's sister and potential counselor. W what do you think, King Valerius? Tilly asked kindly, as if she were asking a shy child to contribute. He blinked. He felt a little like a shy child. I was just going to say, Valerius cleared his throat, that Raziel and I would be willing to set anyone who is mean to you on fire. That hadn't been what he meant to say. Both Tilly and Marban just stared at him with open mouths. Then Tilly giggled and smiled broadly at him. Marban snorted. Perhaps immolation should be a last resort option, Marban replied dryly with suspicious twitches of his lips. Thank you, King Valerius, Tilly beamed just like her brother. I feel better already. He nodded, blushing. Any time. I may not have an answer to the behemoth, Valerius thought, but I can make Tilly laugh. Keep the Bryce siblings laughing may be the best thing I can do right now. Now, Tilly, Valerius said, tell us more about these friends of yours. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying Dragon's Reign so far. Dragon's Reign is free for you to enjoy, but not free for us to make. There is a whole team working with me for audio editing, artwork, graphic design, and custom music. Most YouTube channels and podcasts have sponsors and take ads, but because of the kind of content we make, we can't run ads or get sponsors. Instead, we have other ways you can support me and the team behind this gay romance audiobook. One easy way is to buy or borrow my books from Amazon. They are all gay romance set in alternative worlds with vampires, or shifters, and other magical beings. You may not know that even if you borrow books with your Kindle Unlimited subscription at Amazon, they are free for you, but they still earn us money. The books are published under the name Ex Aratari, which actually means wraith in Romanian. And if you love audiobooks, you can get professionally narrated versions of every one of my books on audible.com. The link to my author page is in the description below, as well as to the first book of the series I think you'll really like. Thank you so much for your support. People like you enable me and the team to keep writing these stories of gay romance, magic, monsters, and true love, and producing this very fun podcast for everyone. Thank you.